Neil, give him a hand. Let me hear it for me. Welcome to our surrogate training program. If you'll all remove your clothes and put them under the chair. That's right. <laughs> Some H2O. Yeah. <laughs> Put your head in. <laughs> hey, everybody, thanks. I hope you enjoyed it. Give it up, guys. Come on. You asked about the truck driver? He's still running. Yeah. <laughs> no, the guy I own the truck. truck. He, he starts running. And they're yelling, God, God, he just kept going. I'll be my head. Somebody go to Austin and bring him back. <laughs> I've never seen someone get away drive slower as she's pounding on the back window. I know. Leather faces. You know, but that's right part there. of the deal. But, but they tried to work it out like the guy was like, I can't find the pedal. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys, I know you and a lot of that cast have a big theater background. And... Yeah. I am curious because before I got into film, I was also in theater. And so it was interesting to hear transitionally, what was it that kind of got you guys motivated? Was it Texas Chainsaw being approached to be in that film? What was the motivation for you guys to kind of transition from theater to film? Join a film. I mean, every, every young actor, you know, who's done a lot of theater, but he wants to do film because we think that's where the fucking money is. <laughs> you know, I was doing a, a children's play for the summer in Chicago at the Goodman Theater called Terrible Tales. <laughs> We're in green and yellow party colored tights and dancing around telling folk tales and singing folk songs from around the world to children, and uh, two shows a day, six days a week, for like $275, you know. But in all fairness, my rent, my share of the rent was like uh, $55 or some shit. <laughs> we had this huge apartment, there were five of us living there. And, uh, and it was 1973, so, but, um, but still, you know, you're talking about what, $13 a, a show or some shit? I mean, <laughs> you know, we had Mondays off. We were dark on Mondays. Remember that term? Theater's dark. Um, it's like, what, the lights don't work? No, we're not open. <laughs> but, um, so, I wanted to learn about film. I, you know, hope to do film. I hope to do theater and film and everything. So it was my first feature. I had done some industrial commercials and you know a couple other things. And uh, are you telling me to hurry up, Daniel? Because I ain't going to. Always. Tournament Men is not here, so I have to carry on the tradition of talking way too much about shit nobody cares about. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? <laughs> This is my life. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I jumped at the chance. I wanted to learn all about it. And I spent a lot of time on location, on the set, when I wasn't working and you know, helping out. You know, uh, doing the, the equipment and just picking up the slack wherever I could. And uh, to learn, I want to know all about the filmmaking process. So that's what encouraged me, besides the fact that and I wanted to go to Texas in the summer, you know, from Chicago. And what about you? What about what your kind of journey? Well, I, 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 was, I was doing Shakespeare on We, wonderful, wonderful stage productions where there was actual acting involved. Uh, Mostly film work is just, you know, they film little snippets and they put it all together and you don't have a clue sometimes in the scene what you're doing because they won't tell you. Um, <laughs> Oliver Stone casts me in JFK to be an FBI agent 
for the sole purpose of asking me questions about Chainsaw. That's showbiz. You know, there were like 8,000 people, who act, real actors, who could have done the part, but he's looking down at the resume going, oh, oh my God, look at that guy. Look at that. He turns to the casting director and he goes, we'll find something for us. He goes, well, we're already cast. He goes, we'll find him something. I want to talk about the film. You know the scene where the uh, Terry is in the swing and she stands up and walks towards the house? <laughs> All of her shots went, oh, I hope they do that. It was a, a simple crane shot where they just look through it. I said, Mr. Stone, cranes are like $1,400 a day and $9.50 for an operator. We had $9.50. So we, we'll hold it up for two. I said, well, I'll tell you, but you won't believe me. Sure. Okay. We got two roadies, large, hulking men, and put one on either side of the swing, that far off camera. <laughs> and when she stands up, they lift the whole thing up, and the dolly track goes underneath, and they put it back down. All of a sudden goes, bullshit. I said, I told you you wouldn't believe me. But I segued into voice work because I figured out very quickly that I could talk stupid and not have to go into politics. <laughs> and they would pay me. And so I, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. <laughs> I got all the dirt you need. I got more to house, but I get to try. <laughs> I did 26 different voices in 106 episodes of Gotcha Man until I was so schizophrenic. Like, there was, but it was good, though, because there was always someone to talk to. <laughs> you and you, 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 <laughs> and you told me in the lobby. These usually sidetrack people. You told me in the lobby at which you served. You were in Vietnam, so first, thank you very much for your service. We hear the weirdest shit in Vietnam. We'd like be hiding behind some trees, and we'd hear them talking over there, and they would like take a shot at us, and I'd yell real loud, "Hey, stop shooting me! You don't even know me!" <laughs> and they would laugh, and they wouldn't even know what bush they were firing. <laughs> I didn't war, know. War, I don't know if you know about war, but it's really scary. I got a 4F, I, I had a 4F because I had indicted by a grand jury for traffic and drugs. <laughs> so I had the best thing I ever did, man. I didn't get drafted. What, what, what he's referring to is, he said, how difficult was it to make that movie? And I said, well, I was in Vietnam and, and I moved troops through Triple canopy jungle easier than making this film. That's the short version. Oh, oh God. Making a film was very, very, uh, it wasn't an easy shoot. It was my first feature film shoot, and uh, until I did any other ones, I didn't realize they were all like that. <laughs> you know? Um, and uh, uh, Toby's methods were, well, for instance, the, the, I might be getting off what the question was. No, go ahead. But that long, on my last day there, which was, that, which was uh, I don't know, 29, 32 hours or something, in costume and makeup, under the lights, in a 100 degree heat, you know. Um, it took just forever to do that dinner party thing. And the way that Toby shot, it was very unconventional. I know now. Because what's generally done is you do, when you got a scene like that, you should do a couple of masters. One from one side of the table of the whole scene, another from the other side of the table, maybe one from either end. And get that over with. And then when you go to uh, two shots, close-ups and over the shoulders, you just shoot little snippets. Well, for instance, when Ed had to do his close-ups, instead of them just shooting him saying his lines a little bit at a time, 
so I have something to cut into. Toby made us do the whole fucking scene every time. When the camera is only on Ed, for instance. And it was cruel, you know. It wasn't wasting a whole lot of film, I reckon. But in retrospect, you know, it dawned on me a couple of years ago when I was watching the film as an audience that how grueling that scene is and how the tension, you know, and the editing is beautiful, right? And, and the way the tension builds and builds and builds until uh, Marilyn, you know, the grandpa can't hit her and Marilyn gratefully jumps out the window and runs and all that stuff. The tension in the room is so palpable. And it was really stress and tension between all of us. And I think, you know, I told he was alive and I could ask him, except he hadn't, you know, he doesn't, didn't talk to me about it. <laughs> um, I think he was wearing us down until he got us to that point where he got what he wanted. And that was like, cut, that's a wrap, everybody, thank you very much, you know. Does that make any sense to you, Ed? No. <laughs> My name is Mikilius Recibita, and I don't know what you're saying. But the rising tension in that scene, like you mentioned, kind of goes with the full movie, because his shot choices of close-ups and just the, the, center, or the, uh, the score rising with the tension throughout, it really adds to it. And the first instance that that takes place, I think, is really when we see you and for the first time in the van, and you, you know, you're wigging out, but you keep looking at Franklin. By the way, I may be kind of like an asshole for saying this, but I kind of enjoyed watching Franklin give. You know what I'm saying? Oh, well, yeah. he's cheered. Oh, really? oh, he's just cheered. And Paul Partain was one of the nicest guys he ever was. Not, not, not when we filmed. He was a sweetheart. Well, well, not when we filmed. Well, I can have any scenes with sure. him, so. He was, no, he was doing method acting, and every day he would come and stay in character the entire day and just piss everyone off. It worked. <laughs> Cut to a couple of years later, of course, he's married a lovely woman, and he was the nicest guy ever. And we went, who are you? <laughs> we, we, we had to be talked out of whack him on the set. He, well, stole, I, he stole my raspberry thing, and he, all kinds of really nefarious. The scene where they're at the van and Marilyn's trying to get the flashlight, oh, that is in really, real time. It was really He was supposed to let her have it, but he didn't. He just said, no, no, we're going to tell it, tell it. And she finally just hauled off and knocked the shit out of him. And, and told, told me to on the other side of the camera talking to the producer going, <laughs> you want to cut? Hell no! They don't kill each other. Yeah, this is good, that's, that's this a good stuff. Thing. It's no. like, Sally, 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 give me the keys. Give me the keys. I'll go, I'll go with you. I'll go with you. I'll go but that, with that is I'll in real you. time. <laughs> All of her pounding on him is in real time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's shot, it's shot beautifully. It's all by the headlights of the van and everything. That's a marvelous scene. But part of the. I think. The character of uh, Franklin, if you knew Tim Hankel and his sense of humor and his genius as a writer, Tim Hankel is probably the first screenwriter ever to make the handicapped guy an unsympathetic character. <laughs> and Tim thought it was just fucking hysterical. He'd just crack up. I mean, he tried not to like, ruin takes with Franklin because he was trying not to laugh. <laughs> you know, and it's just a stroke of dark comedy genius, I think. That, you know, it never happened before. You know? Going back to, going back, <laughs> going back to the, uh, to the band, what was Toby's kind of like direction for you? Because you're, you and Mosley in two, 
body language wise are very similar, especially the chase with you chasing her down the highway and then him in two chasing her up that hill. The frantic movements. It's, it's funny you should ask that question. During the entire filming process from beginning to end, Toby Hooper said one sentence to me. One. I was doing a combination of my schizophrenic nephew and the wonderful actor Struther Martin. What we got here, failure to communicate that kind of halting thing that the wonderful actor Struther Martin did from Cool Hand Luke. And I was combining my character of my real life schizophrenic nephew with all the stuff that he does and Struther Martin. And the one sentence that Hooper said to me during the entire filming process was, he took his little Clint Eastwood cigar out of his mouth and said, um, do some more of that Strother Martin shit. <laughs> do some more of that Strother Martin shit. Oh, yeah, well, he was that was it. Strother was, was one of his cut, best no, friends. No, no, no. Cut to Director's Fortnight in California at the Director's Guild ten years later. It's on camera. Oh, Mr. Hooper, uh, how did you elicit such a wonderful performance by that the guy who didn't play the HR. Well, he was a young amateur, difficult to work with at many times. What I was going for was a kind of milieu. Yeah. Did some more of that other mind shit. Yeah, he also uh, My he... six children at that point said, you can't kill him, they'll know it's you. <laughs> And I thought, how bizarre is this? Because I was going to whack him because he didn't get all the money in me. So I was going to whack him. I'm from Arizona, Houston, Texas. She, she, she don't steal from me. It's not good. Anyway, I was going to whack him, but my six children came to me and said, they did an intervention. She said, you can't kill them. You can't help it. They'll know it's you. We're doing a show in Compton, and two black kids come and go, we really got one out. We'll whack this motherfucker. <laughs> They were dead serious. <laughs> I said, no, no, don't no, whack them. <laughs> Please. <laughs> don't know it's me. No, oh, man, you, you feel like being, you know, a lasso or some shit. Kill me. I said, no. Please don't kill me. You know what you were saying about what he said to the directors go and all that stuff. Was he, it, it, people started reading a lot of stuff into the film. Like it's an analogy of you know more news and that and blah 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 blah, blah. which <laughs> it's just a crock of shit, you know. <laughs> but but once he saw the, the hype going on about just how genius this film is, he started playing into it. Oh yeah, 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 to keep the hype going. You know? But the, the, the dolly the, the dolly tracks. They you put the camera on the little dolly tracks and then the camera slides up and down the dolly tracks. They had a camera package that cost them like you know, a couple hundred bucks because that's all they could afford. And so they had two pieces of dolly tracks. That's all they could afford. Yeah, we had a couple. The had camera like gets on the dolly tracks and goes to the end, which is about you know, eight feet. Like that. The kid goes, <laughs> it's the end of the dolly track. Cut to the director's book down, Hollywood, California, 10 years later. Uh, the staccato movement, Mr. Hooper, that you used uh, was, was brilliant. Uh, how did you achieve that? What I was going for. I was trying Yeah. Two sets of dolly track. Bye-bye, petrol fire. Funny stuff. He was a jerk. <laughs> No, really, if you want to hear, you know. So, the last time I saw him alive. My six children were guarding him. <laughs> he, um, he was at Warmore Studios, on the, and, uh, which was the old uh, Warner Brothers a lot, I think. And uh, in Burbank. And he was directing the miniseries, Say Once a Lot. 
And my agent said, you gotta go over, you gotta get a appointment with Toby and talk to him. And he has about three or four great goals for you in the sales office. You know? So I set up an appointment with him. I come on to the lot, but I go into his office and uh, his uh, assistant goes, hi uh, John, um, he went to lunch, he's probably coming back to the commissary, he'll be here in 10 minutes or something. And I'm like, okay, so have a seat. Well, in 20 minutes, he's not there. And she goes, I'm sorry, John, I don't know. He'll, he should be here shortly, in some half an hour. He's not there. And uh, so about 20 minutes later, he's still not there. And she was embarrassed, you know. She was like, John, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. So I'm uh, fuck. And I'm walking, there aren't any children or like devout Christians in here, are there? either one, no devout Christian children. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes I crack myself up. <laughs> but, um, so I leave, I'm walking back to my car, and there's fucking Toby, walking across the lot, he has stopped, and he's talking to somebody. You know, so I walk up behind him, I come behind him, and go, hey, Toby. And he turns around and goes, hey, John. I said, we had an appointment, a one o'clock appointment. And he goes, oh, yeah, 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 sorry about that. Um, listen, John, I gave you some thought, and there's really nothing for you in this uh, film, in this series, and uh, except for a $50 a day extra. And I didn't think you'd want to be a, you know, have a job with a $50 a day extra, did you? And I said, no, Toby, I wouldn't. And walked off and never spoke to him again. So then five years ago, I get hired on to do this film in LA, and Tom Holland is directing it from uh, Child's Play and um, Fright Night. And uh, I get this phone call from Tom Holland. And I'm like, face is like, who's that? Tom Holland. He goes, what? I said, why would he be calling me? And she goes, maybe he got hired to direct that film. And I was like, oh, 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 oh. You know? So I call him back. <laughs> and uh, he says, hey, John, oh, I hear from Indiana. I have family in Indiana, not my Bedford, blah, 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 blah. He goes, hey, John, can you, this is a very important role. And it was, it was a marvelous role. And uh, I could play a psycho pedophile. Fuck, it was a lot of fun, man. So much fun. I got to research pedophilia, you know, my wife was like, what search criteria did you use to look this up? I'm like, how can I be a pedophile? I was like, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so he goes, are you, are you up to this? Can you do this role? I said, yeah, Tom, I can do this role. I'm an experienced, educated actor, of course I can do this role. He goes, well, I didn't know anything about this, so I went over to Toby's house. He's a friend of mine. I went, oh, great. And I asked him, you know, how you were and, uh, as an actor. He goes, well, Toby said, well, I don't know. I only hired him because of his stature, because I'm so small. And I was like, fuck. And the thing is, he died before we rolled on that film. So it was like the last thing he did to me in his life was trying to get me shit canned from a really good fucking job. That's how much of a jerk he was. So if I seem bitter, perhaps it's because I have a reason to be. What a way. Especially in this one is obviously the two of you, Gunner, and then Jim Side Out. Yeah. How was he when you're not filming? Because he was Jim. Yeah, Jim was the most wonderful man in the world. He was a brilliant stage actor, and I could do Jimmy as well as Jimmy. Yeah, man, here he come. Get it, do you, man? Here he is. So one day we were all, we were both very pissed off at Toby who'd done some heinous thing. 
and we said, or a change. And, and I said, Jim, come here. Let's wind Hooper up. We'll keep. What are we gonna do? Here? I said, follow my lead. And we're gonna. We had an actual rehearsal of a scene. We hardly ever had rehearsal because you can't. Don't have the time to do them. But it was a scene we wanted to rehearse briefly. So we said, okay, you two rehearse the scene. And we both turned to Hooper and go, we'll keep. And so we start the scene. Well, no, you never hear the idiot. Oh, don't call me that. You always call me that. Yeah, I'm calling you that because that's what you are. <laughs> don't call me that. Oh, you just knock it up. Hooper's like standing next to the producer and he goes, What are they doing? And the producer goes, <laughs> Thanks for messing with you, Toby. And he goes, Cut that out! We both turn to Hooper at the same time to go, Wookie. <laughs> no! He was a terrific guy. Like, he was a marvelous guy. He, he and his, uh, his wife Ruth was a marvelous person. And uh, he had a daughter my age that was a fucking babe, man. I knew I was 20 years old. He had this wonderful testosterone. And uh, he saw me uh, sort of looking at her. <laughs> and he was a super nice guy, but he saw me check her eyes out he wants to do it. Don't even think about it. <laughs> but yes, sir, Mr. C. <laughs> this movie is really a great example of the power of suggestion. And you know how many five dollar bets I've won? I've won thousands of dollars in oh, five dollar oh, bets. Yeah. They always it's a sucker bet. They bet me five dollars that you see that meat hook go right to her. No, you don't. The hook, the hook? The meat hook? The meat hook. It doesn't yeah, go to her. They lift her up and they cut her. You see her reaction to the meat hook. You don't see the meat hook. You can't put the meat hook to the, Because that would involve CGI, which there was none in 1974. Yeah, and what's the other thing? Oh, oh, oh but what's Franklin? Your mind. Your yeah, mind. When, 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 Franklin, when Franklin gets killed, they say, man. But he kills the guy in the wheelchair and he cut practically cuts him in half and all his guts fly out. I say, you never nope. see that. It's all shot from behind and silhouette of it. You know, you don't you see some blood flying up off the saw into the gunner's uh, clothes and face and all that stuff. But you don't see him being, you know, there's no bags of entrails, you know. So, yeah. so we're doing a thing in, in, in Hollywood with the industrial light magic crew, and they got all their jackets on. Wait a minute, how, how, wait a minute, how'd you make a movie with no CGI? <laughs> I said, well, we didn't have it, but, but how'd you make the movie? Well, they said jump out the window, we jumped out the damn window. <laughs> <laughs> Bad news, room was on the second floor. <laughs> I think that is a testament to what makes horror so special. And it's four words. Mother fucking practical effects. Yeah. And you, with that comes a shitload of work. And you guys are on a limited budget in the hottest of the hot Texas. I know that uh, I saw it on the, I read it on the internet, so God knows it has to be true. But the uh, the power of suggestion, which we talked about, there was an article that I read that he thought that you guys were gonna like walk away from this thing with like a, a, a like PG esque rating to get yeah. to get wider distribution. Nope. And I mean, obviously that got shut down real fast. But when you guys were on set, was he like? Really optimistic, like this thing is. No, they, he was consumed. They, they would, him and Hinkle and the, the Danny Pearl, the, the, the cinematographer, would go and sit down in the dirt on the side of the road and go, Well, uh, we should put the camera, where should you put the camera? We, we should put the camera somewhere. Danny, where should the camera? We should put in front of the car. Oh, okay. No, they had this shot list. A shot list is 
what scenes you're going to shoot, written on the back of envelopes, for God's sake. You know, no. And, they, and he never, and the thing is, that, and Danny, Daniel Pearl was the one who insisted, you know, because it was just so unorganized. And, and uh, Daniel told me this in Long Beach a few years ago when we were together. He said, you know, about the second day or something, because I need a shop list, you know, we can speed this thing up a little bit. We had a shop list. The and so they sat down, they made a shop list and the next, for the next day. And Toby, of course, shoot out the window immediately. He just started, you know, winking. So, and it was frustrating for Daniel, you know, but man, the film would not have done anything if it wasn't for Daniel. Actually, Danny, Danny Pearl was the second cinematographer. Remember what happened to the first one? No. <laughs> he left the lens cap on. And so, you know what? We need to get a guy that doesn't do that. No, what the fuck? I don't recall. Well, he was with. Huh? Who? No, I wasn't there yet. Uh, no, I, I, you had already. Wow. You guys, if you have a question, Rob, can you raise your hand? Hey! If you guys have a question in the odd, or for. And the horse is going to be way in the back row. Jesus. All right. I need high exercise. Hi there. What's your name? What's your question? It's in the middle. Yeah. Um, for both of you, um, after the, the real grueling shoot. I'm sorry. Can you talk louder? Yeah. Um, the grueling shoot of Texas Chainsaw Massacre is sort of legend with the heat you put up with and all the torture. Um, for both of you, what is the easiest film production you've ever put in that you, maybe it was just so uh, luxurious, so well crafted that you just felt like it was just it was pleasurable? Experience. What was the easiest film shoot we ever had? Yeah. That was my aunt and yeah, yeah. at Bar Mitzvah. Each. 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 Um. The, the, the one we were on in Tennessee, Ben Dixon's. Oh my God, that wasn't easy. No, it wasn't. Never mind. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I, I, but I got track of horse. That's why I liked it. I got to wear a, a Civil War costume and ride a horse, so I was like a fucking young actor heaven. Even though I was fifty, it was fifty. I was fifty years old. It was over at that time, but. You know, every young actor wants to be in a, a you know, ride a horse or a movie. You know. <laughs> no, seriously, the easiest thing I ever shot was a Disney film called My Boyfriend's Back. Because on a $12 million film, uh, that actually only cost them $4,000, $4 million, but that's a long story about how they do films. Uh, they have guys who take care of guys who take care of guys who see to it that guys are doing what guys are doing. But it is so easy on a film like that because they bring you in, they sit you down, they shoot for two minutes, they take you back, they sit you down, they bring you back. And, you know, so it's like, okay, I'll do my three lines, and now I'll eat some Doritos. So on an A film like and that, it is, it is very an easy to film unless you're, doing, unless you're doing an action scene, which we didn't. So it, it, an A film like that, it's very easy to, to just kind of hang out and do your eight lines a day and, and you know, eat. $400 for snacks. You know. Chainsaw 3D for me was easy. You know, I only worked on it for two days, but um, excuse me. Um, for one thing, I had an air conditioned trailer, or I don't know, honey wagon, part of a trailer, and uh, in my own bathroom, and a uh, uh, makeup table, and all that shit. You know, I had to, and so I would just go and they called me and then they, I'd hop in a van and they'd take me to the house and let me out. And, you know. uh, and it paid quite well and it paid on time. So uh, I mean, it, was a, it was an easy shoot. 
But, but you always hope that you're gonna work with like really great actors who do great things because they pull you along with them and it's so much easier for your job. And I, I always wanted to work with great people. Like, I wanted to work with Christopher Walken. Oh my gosh, the wonderful Christopher Walken. And my friend said, oh, I just did a film with him. I said, really? He was in it. I said, well, tell me about it. What did he do? What did he do? He said, well, uh, they called lunch and we were doing a seaside uh, scene and Mr. Walken got up and he walks down to the edge of the water and everybody was sitting at the table just starting to eat their sandwiches. And Mr. Walken took all his clothes off, folded them neatly and put them on the edge of the beach and walked into the water. And they all went, what's Walken doing? I don't know. He walked into the water up to here and turned around and the water was like this. 30 minutes go by. They call lunch. We're back, which means lunch is over. He walks out of the water, picks up a towel and walks He's putting his clothes on. And he turns to the entire cast and says, for lunch, I was an alligator. <laughs> pray, pray, oh, please, that you will be part of that someday. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, you got somebody else out there? I sure do. Hi there. What's your name and your question? Hey, I'm Eric. Uh, Gutter said that everybody hated him for a couple decades after the movie. You guys mentioned that you didn't really like Peter on stage or on shot. Uh, was that true? or? Well, I think the terminal flatulence had a lot to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the, I, I missed, I couldn't hear what you were saying. See, somebody said that we all hated Gunner. That's not true. Oh no, God no! He was a close friend of mine. Oh yeah, he was. He was a, he was a, sweet he was a big teddy bear. He was a very nice man. Do you know that his IQ was like 148 or something? He wrote books on. Do you even know what an estuary is? I didn't. I had to look it up. He wrote books about the estuaries of Maine. He was writing a poetry magazine when they cast him. He was. Really? Yeah, he was an incredibly really? intelligent man and very, uh, very good writer. He, he was an excellent. And a marvelous sailor, you know. He, he wrote a book about sailing, and he cruised on many big uh, sailboats in the North Atlantic coast, you know, because he was a fucking Viking, you know. <laughs> well, he was from Iceland, you know, and, uh, he was actually a very good looking man. He, yeah, and he they, was. He remember was. when they, Toby came to him and said, he was trying to take his mask off, it's 107 degrees. He wanted to take his mask off so he could breathe. And they, there were these people with cameras trying to get a photograph of him with his beautiful Nordic, Icelandic face in contrast with the mask. And he, they paid him like an extra hundred dollars, which was a fortune in those days, to keep the mask on. So nobody could get a picture of it without the mask. He, uh, I couldn't take my makeup off. It was not a mask. It, it was latex, but it was uh, put on in sections and glued down to my face, you know, or my entire head, really, with a spirit gum. And, uh, but Gunner's was a mask, and he could take it off, but they would not let him take it off unless, unless the setup was going to take uh, more than 15 minutes or something. And they would hide him in the trailer where nobody could see And, uh, but the setup, it never took 15 minutes. So ergo, he never got to take his mask off, you know. So he and I were suffering uh, terribly, you know, but. Um, so no, we never hated him. No, we never hated him. And, uh, you know, I, <laughs> the last time the three of us worked together was in Connecticut at a convention. We were doing this, and I could, I had a wonderful time spending any time with Gunner. And he, for one thing, he thought it was really funny. I could make him laugh, you know. And um, we were doing this uh, breakfast with Leatherface thing or something. Do you remember that thing? And can I know? You know? What? You old fuck. <laughs> Well, you know, his, his memory was shot, but this guy had asked, you know, about how, how what made it different than... I hope you have enough for everyone. Uh, 
What made our film different from other, you know, the slasher films of the 70s that came after it? And I said, well, there's no blood and guts. There's very little blood and guts. And it's also chested, and there's no TNA. There's no titties, no. And I said, the close, you know, I said, my character, Grandpa, has the closest thing to sex that any character in a film is. And this kid goes, sitting in front of us, says, oh. <laughs> he goes, oh. You mean like when Grandpa's lifting up the hammer and then bringing it down, lifting it up and bringing it down? <laughs> And I went, no, I was talking about sucking on a beautiful girl's finger. <laughs> but, you know, whatever blows her skirt up, Daniel. And Gunnar started laughing and could not stop. <laughs> and the rest of the weekend, whenever things would be slow, he'd look at me and just start laughing. I'd say, what? He'd go, whatever blows her skirt up, Daniel. <laughs> And he got, he was diagnosed uh, the following week with pancreatic cancer and it passed shortly after that. Ron, we got another one out there? You got it, I'm getting the wrap up sign, so I'm sorry to those that didn't get to, this will have to be the last question. So what's your name and your question? Uh, my name's Manny. Uh, my buddies and I watched Leatherface, uh, Chainsaw Massacre in the 90s, hundreds of times. We quote it, memorize the lines, and die laughing. I'm sitting here chuckling to my wife. Did you guys ever find the one-liners funny during the making or years later? Like, cost of electricity, after you're an idiot, like what your brother did, did to the door. Did you see? I remember when they came up with that line. That was did awesome. you see the scene where Marilyn runs by the little house, makes an excellent turn right through the little gate thing and runs into the house. Gooder is chasing her. He weighs 340 pounds. He can't stop. He goes by the gate and has to come back. <laughs> it's in the film. John and I are over behind the camera going, whoop, 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 taller than they actually needed to be to make him even bigger. <laughs> he was referred to as a Keystone Cops term. <laughs> and the, uh, look what your brother did to the door. I remember when that, you know, he, uh, Kim just shot that out there. You know, right, you know, when the Jim Cedar was coming up and he goes, wait, 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 try this. Get pissed off about the door. And so Jim just goes, wait a second. He goes, look what your brother did to the door. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved, I loved all the uh, f weird uh, profanities like, uh, shut up, you bitch hog. I mean, who ever heard the, who ever heard the term bitch hog? <laughs> you, you don't live down where I live. Huh? <laughs> The funniest scene in the whole movie, if you were on set that day, I mean, we had to be restrained and gags had to go in mouths. And you, the guy at the gas station, who's sitting there staring at the sky, <laughs> was a friend of Marilyn Burns. And so they, she said, can you, Toby, can you put my friend in the scene? Just anything. He said, okay, well, I have him sit in the chair. And, then, and he had this mop bucket full of real soapy water. And Seedow walks over to talk to the people in the van, and he follows him and takes this two-foot piece of ta old towel and slaps it on the windshield. And the whole windshield that the camera's supposed to be looking through is inundated with soap. And he goes, and, and so they, and you can see it in the film, they start laughing inside the van, because they're like, what's the hell? Who is this guy? And they didn't even know who he was. And so, See now walks back, the guy's in the back with him. They say something to Mr. See now, he comes back, and the guy comes back with him and does it again. <laughs> I think the chill, it was like we, were, we had to leave the set because we're like, <laughs> so Yeah, the second time. We're trying to film it. 
The second time, Amon actually turned the windshield wipers on and totally splattered Jim C. down with the filthy, filthy yeah, water. Jim, <laughs> it's in the film. And Jim goes, well, yeah, look, look, that shit's going to look in the face. <laughs> <laughs> he was, I think that guy that sold. was a script, yeah. Didn't he sell newspapers on a corner in downtown Houston or something, too? Was that guy? Yeah. No, he had a lot of money. Oh, really? Yes, he did. Why not? He paid for Maryland's parking meeting. Well, you guys, I can talk to you guys all day about this movie. And my cat's here. And, <laughs> but, my God, it is a masterpiece, as evidence tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Love Horror Events, give it up one more time for John Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank to think that later I can come and do this, it's just mind boggling to me and it's all because of it's because of all of you and then just thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. John Dugan, thank you, Jimmy. Appreciate you. And thank you all for coming out here tonight. I know it's uh, crazy COVID times right now, but appreciate you being here and supporting.